Welcome to the Albany Book Festival Online, presented by the New York State Writers Institute at the University at Albany. You can learn more about the festival and find direct links to independent booksellers at our festival webpage, albanybookfestival.com. Follow us on social media and hear for more videos from the Writers Institute. Hello, how are you all? Welcome. My name is Sir Radio. I am from WAMC Northeast Public Radio. I'm the host of the Roundtable and the Book Show. Thank you. Uh, if you know who I am, thank you. If you don't, uh, we will have technicians that will make sure that you have it on your preset of your car. On your uh, excellent. I am uh, so thrilled to be here. I have wonderful events. Uh, to and wonderful people to talk to today, and I, I couldn't be happier because all of them are friends and people that I love very much, and, and so it's a great honor to, to be with them um, today. Simon Winchester, of course, is a writer, journalist, broadcaster, the acclaimed author of many books, including The Professor and Men, and feel free to clap for your favorite. <laughs> And Krakatoa, all of New York Times bestsellers. And his latest book is Land, which is beautiful, uh, How the Hunger for Ownership Shaped the Modern World. And that is the book right out there, uh, right here, that he will be signing out there right after our, our uh, time together here. I am also thrilled to have Set go with us, set go. Set go. So the other night, uh, the other day, uh, Paul Brownell, uh, the writers institute, was on a program we were uh, talking about this event, and we, I was mispronouncing and, and murdering um, Sesco's name, and Simon emailed me during the interview and said, "That's not how you say it." <laughs> so I had a real time correction and. So I very uh, thank you very much. Um, Sesco is a ceramic artist, photographer, and journalist who began a professional life working in the finance world in Wall Street. Made a change to journalism, moved to the Berkshires to pursue a lifelong interest in ceramics and the visual arts. Her work is absolutely stunning. She has even found a uh, local newspaper in her town in Sesco, Massachusetts, which is a very cool, a very great place. Thank you. Simon, the topic of this conversation is a creative marriage. Okay, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's survived for 15 years now. Can you can you hear him? Yes, can you hear me? Okay, great. Thanks. Well, we don't know we met in San Francisco at the Exploratorium. And Setsi, I call her Setsi. Setsi. Well, that's Setsi. easier. I don't know that. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay. So I met. We have spoken many times in the past, and she she worked for many strands of the NPR, but particularly at uh, Talk of the Nation, but occasionally they brought a piece in front of me. And so she went up, and I had this image of this woman who was called Setsko Sarton. That was her name. Yeah. And because I was familiar with Michiko Capitani, who was the entry editor of the New York Times, I sort of imagined that Tetsi was something like Michiko Capitani, a fierce dragon woman, yeah. really, really dark, gray hair, and spectacles, and a very, very sort of, sort of uh, strict affect. And then I met Tetsi in San Francisco, where she was doing a live program on the San Francisco earthquake. On the 18th of April 2006, the earthquake itself was on the 18th of April 1906. And um, well, as they say, we're a big bit of another. So, um. <laughs> <laughs> what would you like to add to that story? Well, first of all, for creative marriage, um, can people hear me? Can you hear me? Can they hear you? We're a little too much. We have been on the first round of the Well, well for, for example, some of the things that happen in creative marriage is something that says Mitch Kokoski is a dragon. I will get in there. 
1924, the same year that they passed the Asian Exclusion Act, which said no Asian people can enter the United States. And actually, it was Chinese people who were the first to be specifically excluded in 1882. And at that time, they had to create a brand new federal agency that never existed before, which was called the Immigration and Naturalization Act, INS, or today ICE. So ICE was essentially created to keep Chinese people out. So that work is, is that ongoing for you? Is that ever evolving? Um, well, it's, I, I have, it's, it's, it's a, I haven't finished the grammar project. Um, yeah. This part two is called the Descent Colors, and it's about the whiteness laws. And I call it Descent Colors when I was researching. I found out that uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, when she had a dissenting opinion, she would wear a specific collar that was that she was dissenting this, this ruling. And so I decided to create my own descent collars of all the laws that have been passed. You know that that said you had to be white in order to you know become a citizen and have rights and have all, all the you know freedoms that Americans are supposed to have. So that's part two. Part three is called um, the Play Project, and I'm putting all the exclusion laws like the Page Act. It, the Page Act was predated the Chinese Exclusion Act. And 1875, it said that no Chinese woman could enter the United States effectively unless she could prove she's not a prostitute. So, you know, how do you prove a negative? How do you prove you're not God? You can't. Yeah. So, you know, there, there are all, it's, all these things that happen to non white people were actually legal. They, they, were, they were, you know, they were part of the, they were legislated. Um, or they were uh, done by executive order, or and they were um, supported and backed by the judicial system. So, and that includes Executive Order 9066, which is what my primary project, um, Yellow Roll Project, is about. So, you're now on stage with two of the whitest people we've ever imagined. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's, you know, but I'm interested in the um, of how you take that history, and then does that ever inform your work? So I you look at as a man. Um, uh, I mean, for instance, this the, the book on that it, it largely came out of discussions that Betsy and I had at breakfast over talking about American immigration policy. It was about three years ago, I guess it was. And why was it that so many? Europeans came over in the 1870s, 1880s. And what did they do when they came here? Well, one of the things that was self evident is that they immediately started dispossessing Native Americans of their land, stealing their land. And we thought through this conversation that writing a book about the whole notion of the ownership of land would be fascinating. So that triggered the book, and effectively. So basically, you know, we, we were talking about when all these white people, you know, a long time ago, it was, you know, it was it was an arduous journey to get on a ship and come over, you know, across the ocean. Right. What drove these people over? And I have been doing, you know, research about European land laws and things like that. And um, I, I found out about the Enclosures Act and the um, Highway Clearances. And I said that a large percentage of Europeans came in the, you know, 17th, 18th century, and they were all being dispossessed by their own, own um, rulers in countries. So they were losing their land. And, and they were coming over here. I, mean, I think so it's probably valuable to just very, very briefly explain what the intelligence acts were, because I mean, they were crucially important to what goes on in this country and in the other side of the world. Prior to, well, let's say, the 16th century in Britain, um, most land was owned in common. It was common land. So you had a village, you had a fields, and everyone, if they 
child in the clinics or those things of that would grow their their children raise their animals on this one piece of land and that was fine so the pigs tend to be turnips and the cattle would travel over there. So there was this phrase the, the tragedy of the commons. The commons were not very efficient in um, producing food. And that was all right until the 14th and 15th centuries. And then population movement started to increase, food production started to become something you thought about. You know, how can we make it more efficient? And someone came up with that idea. And instead of allowing the land to become in common, we would segment it into secondary parcels and have it held privately so that farmer A would raise his cattle on track. <laughs> and that did have an obviously beneficial effect. Then it became legally enforceable in 1604, which is a crucial date. And from then on, for that, thousand enclosures acts were passed in Britain, and most land in Britain then became privately owned. And this had the result, yes, of increasing food production, but it also left a lot of disgruntled villagers who said, well, we used to grow our turnips here, but now we're not allowed to get there. We are literally dispossessed. So what did they do? They then went to the cities that were beginning to grow the land in their own Or, well, that was 1736 when that began, so it was a hundred years back. But then they got on ships and came to this part of the world where the activities on the But what did they do? These people who were disgruntled because they'd been dispossessed. They arrived on these shores, and immediately started dispossessing people. So it's not like bullies in school are people that were themselves bullied. So dispossess people, then dispossess others. And thus begins the whole tragic story of white Americans taking the land away from the natives who had said success, we're not even allowed to be citizens until then. Yeah. Well, I, I, and I'm not, I don't think all white people wanted to do that. I mean, there were a lot of white people who, you know, had married native people, they had, um, you know, joined tribes because, um, or, I should say, tribes were actually nations. Um, I think I was that changing to the word tribe um, so that it became more primitive. But um, so there were, there were different nations. Um, and uh, a lot, and, and in fact, Benjamin Franklin writes about this that a lot of colonists were leaving the colonies and joining the Indian nations. And so they, they started making laws that if you, if you marry a non white person, you would lose your citizenship or you would lose you know, certain rights. So that, those are the anti miscegenation laws. So that, I live in the state of Massachusetts. The Ma Massachusetts colony was the third colony. To pass anti discrimination laws, saying that you could not marry a native person or a black person. If you did, you would lose your citizenship. Just out of curiosity, the name of this is a creative marriage. Is this what dinner time is like? <laughs> 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 What's that? Right. The small oh, lunch. Oh, you went back. We do talk about it a little bit. <laughs> 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 it's so funny because you know, our fights aren't about. Now, my understanding of uh, from remembering when I interviewed you about this book, is that the part of the evidence was that you uh, you had bought a, a, a parcel of land within uh, in in Massachusetts. So, well, in in New York, in New York, in New York. And, uh, and and how that changed when you became a United States citizen, and how you felt that you were a landowner in this country. Yes, that was uh, basically I was in Hong Kong when I came back from Hong Kong. Uh, Luke had an automobile public in Marseille, and and um, and then later I bought a hundred of acres of land around it. Produced this land on the north facing side of the hill. So he had a, a trees and animals and so, but he couldn't do anything with it. He 
more of the African American slave trade um, got bigger. But um, so there were always skirmishes between the colonists and the indigenous people. So King George III in six, uh, 1679. No, 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 1770. 1770. Anyway, before independence. Yes, I think it was. No, he wasn't alive in 16. Well, I'm dyslexic. <laughs> So anyway, the, the proclamation line was before 1776. He, he said this line, which was the Appalachian Mountains, he said no um, uh, um, well, white sense. colonists can go claim land west of the Appalachians because of that Native people's land. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the complaints. It wasn't just the tea tax, it was land claims because one of the big, you know, George Washington had a huge claim, had his eye on the Ohio Valley. So the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal was, you know, from Virginia. And if you go to Washington, D.C., that canal was supposed to go to his land. They're pretty naive of them to think they could build a canal over the Appalachian Mountains. So I want to get to some questions in the audience. So let me ask this as my final question, which is do you, um, how much input uh, are are you his first reader and is he your first advancing of ideas or showing your work? Um, I do not read his work until it's finished, basically, because it changes so many times that I I I lose I, I don't remember what the book was sometimes because I'll remember the first iteration and then I realize wait till the end. But we do talk about ideas. So, you know, so yeah, endlessly. Um, so, um, but you know, I said so, you read your things. No, so like Johnson, Johnson versus Macintosh, which is a very, very important law in terms of property and ownership. That, you know, in my research, I discovered that. I knew nothing about it. He knew nothing about it. And it basically said it went all the way to the Supreme Court. It was a property battle between, between two white people. And uh, one got it from the federal government, the other one had bought it from a deed from a native indigenous person, and they had a fight over who owns it. And the Supreme Court said it, it decided that no Native American owns land. So, so the other guy, you know, who got it from the federal government owns this piece of land and dispossessed this former Supreme Court justice who actually in the state who had deeded it to his children. So then, like after after Supreme Court says that you know no anybody who has a claim from Native American you don't own your land nobody's going to want to do business with them. So that was 1823. Seven years later, what becomes possible? The Indian Removal Act of 1830 basically says no Native Americans east of the Mississippi. That's how they got rid of all the Native. And I should say just one funny thing because I don't know if you can the second thing. Very nice. Great. He said the book is dedicated <coughs> to Chief Sandy Bear. It's a nice picture. Yeah, yeah. It's 1879. Chief Sandy Bear took his status to the Supreme Court, who finally declared formally for the first time ever that Native Americans were human beings. After that point, they were regarded as squirrels, effectively. I don't know if you've a squirrel. I don't know if you've got a squirrel. Squirrel. Well, you're pretty close. Well, you're pretty close. No, no. Well, I you know. Does anyone have any questions? Anyone have a question for Sesto or? Yes. Hi, Sesto, and thank you both so much for coming here. Um, my question has to do with reparations. I'm sure you've given it some thought, given uh, our background, uh, shared Japanese American history background, we've lost quite for Japanese American reparations. So I'm, I'm wondering if you've been thinking at all, um, this between the two of you, or arguing at all about uh, reparations for Black Americans and uh, for Native Americans, given all the levels you've done in the Native American history. Question about reparations. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't want to speak for other groups. I could just 
speak about what happened to Japanese Americans. And basically, um, there was a fight within the community. A lot of them were like, there's no amount of money that you could pay that's going to make up for the damage that you've done. And they didn't want to take the money because they felt like, you know, they're going to say, okay, we're done with you. You know, you got your money. Um, which was $20,000 for anybody who was still alive. If you were already dead, you could not receive it. So, um, but it, they also passed the Civil Rights Act of 1988, which uh, had uh, they got an apology from the government, um, twenty thousand dollars for survivors, but also created a, a fund to educate the you know the the nation about this history. So that's that's why some of the um, they, they call it confinement sites. I, I call it former U.S. concentration camps, but um, which they were. They, uh, the New York Times. Um, I had a huge fight with the standards editor like a few years ago. He said I couldn't use the word concentration camp, and I said um, actually they were uh, internment camps. It, it's actually misinformation because internment camps existed in 1942, but they were used for foreign nationals. So if you say that they were in Germany, you have to make it seem like all the Japanese were foreign nationals, which they weren't. The majority of them were U.S. citizens, and they were never. And the, the other distinction is that um, to be in an internment camp, you have to be charged with a crime, and you have to be given a trial. And an internment camps were run by the Department of Justice, and they were also protected by the Geneva Conventions, none of which were given to U.S. citizens of Japanese ancestry in the U.S. concentration camps, and that's what they were. They were U.S. concentration camps. Um, are we still stuck on the <laughs> well, I, I was just going to say that my interest, my knowledge is very limited, but it's, it's much more concerned with Native Americans. In that case, it's the whole set of concentration land um, and the, the fact that the, the land and the reservations that they put on were very arid and useless, and even if they were brimming with oil underneath, the people who lived there didn't have the rights to take that mineral wealth. So, what I'm encouraged by in America, you know, the situation of desire needs to be addressed, needs to be changed. The country that is, I think, at last taking some sort of coherent and compassionate step to deal with the indigenous people is New Zealand. And New Zealand, since the 1970s, has been attempting to reform its relationship with its Maoris. It's by no means perfect or approaching perfection, but basically, very crudely, Maoris are getting their land back, which was all taken away in 1841 by actual by Tanguy, it all became a property in Victoria. Well, slowly, mercifully, we're giving it back. And as a result, the relationship between Maori and Pakaba White in New Zealand is a much better situation. It's not particularly good in Australia. There are suggestions it might begin to change, and it is abysmal in this country. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, I wonder. Indeed, but the usefulness of one. Yeah, um, I mean, you're right. And I, the first, when I came here as a young reporter um, in 1972, I think, for the Guardian, based in Washington, the first job I had was to cover the wounded knee protests in the Boundary Reservation in South Dakota. And in terms of Creating a congenial life, it was pretty useless land. Yes, beautiful in terms of prairie, natural, environmental, you know, lots of timothy, lots of alfalfa, that sort of thing. But in terms of um, it being the kind of land that had the communications, that had the ability to have a, a decent sized town or city, it was. Miles and nothing. 
And this would be true whether you were sued or uh, like South Dakota, you would just say, there's nothing here. Everything you can raise in the capital. Um, I agree with you in terms of utility as one of these loaded <coughs> words. Be that involved in the project and that of the University of Iowa Hayes dealing with the prairies and their utility. So I'm very much aware of what you say. In terms of human use of this land, it doesn't have a great human use. They were shipped out to places. You've got to remember that the people in the reservations, in particular the reservations of Oklahoma, came from places in Arkansas and Alabama and the city that were. Extremely prosperous, and their farms were very big and lush, and had lots of animals and so forth. And they were sent off to what was regarded as a pretty hostile prairie environment. And what they need in my view is to be reattached to the land that they first farmed themselves, not putting land which is infinitely more challenging to farm. And so, who does farm it? The big industrial farmers. I mean, you can't add that. No, but we don't learn about Cahokia, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Cahokia was a very, it was an amazingly civilized, you know, uh, um, this is the mountains. The 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 they're gigantic. Have you ever seen the mounds? They're huge. They're in America, and they were very sophisticated. Um, it's 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 yes. No one knows so, anything about and and. There, there are certain facts that we never learned in the United States. Like eighty percent of all the food that's that's consumed around the world was cultivated by indigenous people in North and South America. I mean, they fed the world. Thirty percent of all the you know uh, medicinal medicines uh, were discovered by native people. So um, you know, I can give you an example. Queen Isabella, for example. Um, Contracted malaria because of the tree. And I, Frank, uh, Father Francis, I forget what his last name, but he um, gave her quinine and he's credited with the, you know, discovering the cure for malaria, but it had been used by the indigenous people for a long time. You just don't get credit for it. Um, so there's all kinds of knowledge that was shared or. Um, you know, helped other people, not just their own group, um, that was claimed by others, including them. And there's just, sorry, the one thing, because he has his own land cap. I'm very Yeah, no. he has his own land cap. <laughs> um, it, you know, it, uh, um, one of the reasons why uh, white prerequisite laws are important to look at is because um, it was actually exported um, to other countries. America is the only country that uh, established a, a new nation based on the concept of race, which was white, and it was actually exported to Canada. Um, 1901, uh, Australia uh, instituted the white Australia policy. In 1920, uh, um, New Zealand, uh, passed the white New Zealand policy. And then in 1930s, a brand new uh, nation, uh, Germany was linked to the empire game. And, you know, Germany wasn't a modern country until like, you know, 1830, 18. Um, and it, the Nazi party, you know, wanted to create a German empire. And it studied all these empires, like uh, the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, uh, the Ottoman Empire, the, the British, the Dutch, the, and they decided that the one that they admired the most is the American Empire and its ability to eradicate all its indigenous people and to create a hierarchy based on race with white at the top. So um, that ideology was, started in America and it's it actually was exported. And the reason why it's important to know that after World War II it didn't stop is because a modern nation, the modern nation of South Africa was established um, with apartheid in 1948. 
that's after World War II. How does that happen? I want to thank you all for being here and for uh, being with us this afternoon. Especially thank you for coming out to a real live event with real live people and uh, going through all the rules and all the stuff that uh, keeps us safe. And uh, know how much we appreciate you and how much we've missed you over the last year and a half. <laughs> and of course, I hope you will join me in uh, thanking Sesco and Amazon. If you appreciate our programming and would like to support the Writers Institute, you can find out how at nyswritersinstitute.org.